where we were last time was setting up the formalism of the bracket polynomial so that we could talk about Kravana homology. And that's my plan. Um, I'm going to talk about Kravana homology this time and next time at least. And I'm not quite sure how many more sessions we have in this course, probably a couple more, so beyond this one. So we'll see what we can do with Kravana homology. So can everyone see this? This is visible. I'll assume it is. I'm not hearing a response there. Can you see this? Yes. And you can see my pointer. Yes. Okay, good. So um, here's the bracket, which we're familiar with. And here's the states of the bracket. And the strategy here is that we're going to look at the states of the bracket as a structure in and of itself. And we're going to see that we could ask the question, even without having formulated a homology theory or anything of the sort, we can ask the question, uh, how do these collection of states change when you do randomized removes? And what could you derive from them that would be invariant? And of course, we know that if we add up uh, a contribution product of vertex weights and number of loops from each one and add them up um, and adjust the weights correctly, that we can get something which is an invariant of the knot. But perhaps there are other things you can do. And uh, the structure as a whole is, is indeed a category where an arrow in the category is a map is an arrow from one of these states to another one, which changes an A to a B one change of an A to a B, like that. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And it is useful, as I remarked at the end of the last lecture, to change the variable structure in the bracket to what I'm indicating on this slide. So that means that when I expand on a crossing, I take the A smoothing, and I will still call this the A smoothing, and I will call this the B smoothing. Um, the A smoothing gets a coefficient of 1, and the B smoothing gets a coefficient of minus Q, and the value of the loop is Q plus Q inverse. And the value of a loop next to a uh, disjointly next diagram will multiply by Q plus Q inverse. And we went through last time how this is uh, close to being invariant under Rademeister 2 and Rademeister 3. It's invariant under Rademeister 3 and multiplies by a Q or Q inverse or something like that uh, under Rademeister 2. We don't have to remember it. Um, the next stage in this reformulation is to think of each state loop as acquiring a 1 or a minus 1 so that we expand the states to include these labelings by the circles. Um, an idea due to Vero, which is very useful for keeping track of the books here. So that means that when I say that the value of a loop is Q plus Q inverse, it's literally the sum of the value of a plus loop, which is Q, and the value of a minus loop, which is Q inverse. And then you see that Certainly, the value of a loop is Q plus Q inverse, but if you took the value of, say, two loops uh, together, then you have, um, you, have, uh, <clears throat> you have all of these different possibilities uh, for the labelings of the two, all four possibilities, and you get Q squared and 1 and 1 and Q to the minus 2, and, and in fact, you get Q plus Q inverse squared as before. And what we're doing is we're instantiating the binomial theorem into the combinatorics. But that means that when we evaluate the bracket using this point of view, we, with a Q or Q inverse associated to a loop, we will have a monomial for each one of the enhanced states. 
The other part of the bookkeeping that I have put on this slide is that we will shortly be changing notation one, once again with an X labeling for the minus one and a one labeling for the plus one. For now, you can just take that as um, some person's whim, but uh, it's more than a whim, as you'll see in a moment. So then what we have is that the bracket is the states, the states with the plus and minus ones on them, of minus one to the number of B smoothings, because after all, that expansion only gives you a minus one at a B smoothing, and Q to some power. And the power of Q is equal to the number of B smoothings plus lambda of S, where lambda is the number of loops with a plus minus the number of loops with a minus, because every plus loop contributes Q to the plus one, and every minus loop contributes Q to the minus one. So you get Q to the J of S, the sum of the lambda evaluation and the number of B smoothings. And that's nice. That gives us a sum of monomials for the bracket. And um, this is a nice theoretical point uh, just about the bracket itself. If you want to think about some combinatorial question about the bracket, um, it's helpful to think of it this way. And now we make one more step, and that step is to a collection of states S, um, which have the same I and the same J. And I will define CIA to be the module generated by the enhanced states with I equal to N sub B and J is above. All right. So with a given I and J, you consider the states with that I and that J. Um, and I say module. So that means that what we're going to do, it shows you in advance what we're going to do. We're going to make a chain complex and the I, J, part of the chain complex is going to be a module generated by the enhanced states. The enhanced states themselves are the generators of the complex. And then, of course, I can write the bracket as the sum of all overall possible i's and j's of minus 1 to the i, q to the j, the dimension of the cij for that particular diagram. And this has the look of um, something like Euler characteristics, and we'll reformulate it a little bit and see that, in fact, if there were a chain complex, this would be a certain sum of Euler characteristics. Let's look. Well, I'll look in a moment, but what I want is that the differential that I'm going to define on my chain complex will shift I up to one. That means that the differential is going to have the property that it takes you from B smoothings, I B smoothings, to I plus one B smoothings. And it's going to leave J alone. If that's the case, then the formalism of this would be very nice. And it turns out that that can be the case. And now let's look at what it would mean for J to be constant if I is increasing by one by going back to the formula that we had for that. You could do it in your head, but I want to put the formula in front of you, which, um, alas, seems to be back here. Where was it? We had it. Sorry, here. On this slide. Remember, the J, I want the J to be constant. If the, if the NB, the number of uh, B smoothings, goes up by one, that means lambda has to go down by one. So you can keep that in your mind. You're trying to get the sum of plus and minus ones from the loops, the, just the loop labelings, to go down by one when you make the B go up by one. And we're going to see this in detail in a moment. So... Symbolically, you can think this way. The boundary mapping is going to be taking a state with a, an A smoothing and it's going to be replacing it by that same state with a B smoothing. It's going to be working along one of the arrows of the category. But in fact, uh, a given state may have a number of A smoothings. And so the boundary is actually going to sum 
over all the different ways of taking an A smoothing to a B smoothing. Any individual one of these could be thought of as going through a saddle. You started with a smoothing like this, and you went through a saddle and ended up with a smoothing of the other kind. It's useful to think of it as a bit of cobordism like that, as we'll see. So as I said, the differential should increase the homological grading I by one and leave the quantum grading J alone. That's the a usual terminology for this. I is the homological grading and J is the quantum grading. But you see, I can rewrite my formula for the bracket. This is just a rewrite. I sum on J first, then I sum on I. But if I sum on J first and then I sum on I, then I have the Euler characteristic of the, the C complex with its J fixed. And we said, and that's the reason, one of the reasons why we said we wanted the boundary mappings to fix the J, because then the C dot J would be a subcomplex of the bigger complex of all CIJs, and the boundary maps work inside that. And that has an Euler characteristic, and it has a homology. And the Euler characteristic of the homology is equal to the Euler characteristic of the chain complex. By homological algebra that I'm sure you won't want me to repeat. It's simple counting of dimensions. So that means that if we do define a chain complex, if we do have boundary taking C dot J to C dot plus 1J, um, and boundary composed with boundary is zero, why then uh, we will have a formula for the bracket in the form of q to the j, sum on j, and the coefficient of q to the j will be the other characteristic of this homology. Even if this homology did not turn out to be an invariant of the knot, but it does, but even if it didn't, that would be kind of interesting, right? You would have found the structure of the coefficients of the Jones polynomial in terms of Euler characteristics of homology. But of course, what we hope for is to understand how the homology will behave under Rademeister moves and get a deeper invariant in back of the Jones polynomial in this way. So that's the program. And as I said, the boundary of a given, a given module generator and what is a module generator? It is a state with plus or minus ones labeling it. The boundary of that is going to be the sum of the boundaries along all the arrows going out of that state because every arrow going out of that state changes an A to a B. There's going to be a partial boundary for every arrow going out of that state. And we have to see what the structure of those partial boundaries will be. And in this slide, I have actually told you what the structure is going to be. But I'd better show it to you in more detail. So I'm going to skip the rest of this slide and maybe come back to it as a summary. And I will um, hmm, I'm not happy yet with the way I did this. No, it's all right. It's all right. Okay. Let's go to looking at what could actually happen, how the boundary could work. Then we can come back to summaries. Look at this. Here's an example. I have a loop labeled plus and another loop labeled plus and an A smoothing here. And I'm going to change it to a B smoothing. So that means that in this case, we have uh, that lambda is two. And after collapsing, after taking the two circles to one, we need lambda equal to one. So if these are labeled plus and plus, that must be labeled plus. All right. So it's determined. And if this had happened inside of a larger state, it would still be the same way. These two pluses would result in only one loop here, and these would have to go down by one to a single plus. What if you had a plus and a minus? If you have a plus and a minus, the local lambda is zero, and after, after combining two loops to one, you need it to go down to minus one, which means this has to be labeled minus one. So that's the only possibility. 
And if you had a minus one and a minus one, you want to get to minus two, but you can't. Not on a single loop. There's no way to label a single loop and get minus two. And so you take that point to be zero. Now, what this means is that it looks like you have a multiplication on your module. And it looks like, in this case, that if I call 1 plus and x minus, then you see what this says. It says that 1 times 1 is 1. This says 1 times x is x. This says x times x is 0. And of course, we similarly have x times 1 is 1, is x. So from the point of view of multiplication, where we have two circles going to one circle, it looks like the ring z of x modulo x squared. And that's the reason why I call the minus 1 an x, because it's easy to remember the structure as a structure on the tensor product of two modules into a module by uh, the process of multiplication. Yeah, and the multiplication is happening in this ring, z of x mod x squared. You now see also that this ring can be regarded as the module of a single circle because the module of a single circle is generated by the two loop by loops labeled one and a loop labeled x in other words generated by one and by x and x squared is zero so in general if i have a loop if i have a collection of loops then i have the tensor product of the modules associated with each one and the first part of the boundary mapping is that it's this multiplication, but that's not the whole story. The next part is what happens under co-multiplication. That is what happens when an A smoothing causes a single loop to become two. Well, look at that. Here's one labeled X. The lambda is minus one. We, we convert it into two and we want lambda to be minus two. And so we need x and x. We need to go from minus 1 to minus 1 and minus 1. So that says that delta, thinking from v to v tensor v, delta of x is x tensor x. And then the last one is where, um, <coughs> where I uh, have it labeled 1. And if it's labeled 1 and I wish it to go down to 0, then I need a 1 and a minus 1 on the two loops. And there's no reason for it being one or the other, so we take uh, as the definition of that one to be delta of one is one tensor x plus x tensor one. So I have an algebra now, V, um, with a multiplication and a co-multiplication. Delta of x is x tensor x, delta of one is one tensor x plus x tensor one. This yields what is called a Frobenius algebra. Um, and um, I would postpone telling you the actual definition of a Frobenius algebra to next time. Let's just look at what this algebra does. And we want to add a little structure to the algebra as well. This algebra is essentially going to define for us the boundary mappings in our chain complex. And we want to see how that works. Among other things, we want to see that the order of doing the operations doesn't matter. Uh, that if I were to first do a multiplication and then do a co-multiplication, that I will get the same result as first doing the co-multiplication and then doing the multiplication. The reason for this is that such a, such a restriction will tell you that the boundary of the boundary in your complex is equal to zero. And here at first, I'm going to speak modulo two, and then I will explain how to introduce the integral boundary. But let me go back a moment to the picture of the category. There it is. so that you can look at this. The zero stage of the category with various J's possible is the all A state. The one chains are the ones that have single B's. The two chains are the ones that have 
two beads and the three chains are the ones that have three beads and so on, but it all stops here for the truffle knot. That means that the chain complex itself is the direct sum of this module and this module and this module. The boundary mapping, thinking of it only module two, consists in the sum of this map to the AAB and this map to the ABA and this map to the BAA. Similarly here, there are two maps out from each of these, and you take the sum of them into the sum of these modules here to get the next boundary map. Once you understand that it's going to be the sum, then you can understand what it is you need in order to have boundary map. Because think about boundary boundary. It means that you're going to have double compositions of arrows. You're going to start here, go here, and then down here. But there's also another way to do the same thing, namely on the other side of this rectangle. You can go here and then here. This is doing first this map and then this map, or doing the second map first and the first map second, doing them in two orders. Now, if it's the same, no matter which order you do it in, then you get two times the result of what you started. If you started with X here, you get gamma. And if you started with X here, you get the same gamma, so you get gamma plus gamma down here and mod two, that's zero. Now what we're going to see is that once we get it to work mod two, once we get that these squares all commute, then we can put signs in and get an integral formula for the homology just as well. And I'll explain that in a moment. But right now, we're only concerned mod two, and we want indeed what we have defined is independent of the order in which you do it. So here's a first compatibility check. I start with this state here, which is two circles and, and an A smoothing that's a co-multiplication and an A smoothing that leads to a multiplication. And first I do the multiplication. Two circles become one circle. At this point, you notice the convenience of diagramming with cobordisms. It's more than convenient, as we'll see. And then I go by co-multiplication from the one circle into two circles. I started in this one with both of them labeled one, and I multiplied, so I got a one. This so little circle here is labeled one, and then I co-multiplied, so I got a one tensor X and an X tensor one, and that's my result. Now I try it in the other order. In the other order, uh, I co-multiplied first, getting two circles and three circles all together because this one just comes along to boot. Um, and I had one and one. So I co-multiplied and I have one tensor X plus X tensor one, but then tensored one from that circle. And then I'm going to multiply along these two, just the last two. So that means that I have X tensor one be going to X and I have one tensor X, one tensor one, and that goes to one. And the result is the same, one tensor X plus X tensor one. So it didn't matter in what order I did it. The other thing to notice, and you can check other cases. I may have another case or two in the slideshow, but if I don't, um, you should try everything under the sun on this and see that it does work. But notice something else. This cobordism surface is homeomorphic to that cobordism surface. And so, in fact, what we're saying is that if we think of the morphisms as cobordisms and the composite morphisms as composite cobordisms, then what we're saying about not depending on order is that it doesn't actually depend on anything but the topology of the surface in between the mapping that you get from V tensor V to V tensor V here, or V tensor V to V tensor V here, only depends on the ends and, and the cobordism, but, not, but only on the, on the topological type of the cobordism, not on the particular way that you factored it. So that means that we can go back to our category 
and we can think, aha, this category has richer structure than I might have thought for my purposes. Every one of these arrows is a little cobordism. And when I compose arrows, I get more complicated cobordisms, but I only need to think of the cobordisms that I write down up to homeomorphism. And the category consists in these objects with cobordisms going between them that are taken up to homeomorphism. And so I'm verging on a non-algebraic, but rather combinatorial way of thinking about this structure that we're trying to understand. Here's another example, one and then x. And I multiplied and I get an x and then I co-multiplied and I got x tensor x. Here I have a one and then x and I co-multiplied the one, which is the one tensor x plus x tensor one, tensor x, and now I multiplied it out. And look at the second term. You see in the second term, I have x tensor x here and I have one tensor x there. And then I'm multiplying in the second term. Well, x tensor x goes to zero, and multiplying here, one tensor x becomes x, get an x tensor x. So it works. So this is a very clever little algebra. It seems to know about the topology of the cobordisms. Oh, one more. x and x. x times x is zero. x and x this way, delta of x is x tensor x. And then you're multiplied by x, and, uh, and again, it gave you zero. So lots of them. And uh, so we have this nice picture of the boundary map up to um, up to mod two and understanding it with regard to homeomorphisms of I am um, some of these are a bit redundant, but maybe it's good to look at it this way just for the sake of it. If we were in the complex, we would be saying it this way, wouldn't we? Um, that I would have boundary along line two is multiplication. Boundary along line one is co-multiplication. Boundary along line one is doing co-multiplication tensor one. And then boundary along line two is doing multiplication. And you can write it down in algebra. There is another thing that I want to talk about because I'm thinking about things being invariant under, under topological moves on the surfaces. And you might imagine cobordisms that had births and deaths, just like we talked about before. And so we should think about births and deaths as well. But you'll excuse me, but there's a point that I want to make. No, we'll do it in this order. Let's think about births and deaths. Oh, if I... Uh, I want to find out what would be the right co-unit to have in order for us to have invariance under homeomorphism. The only thing about this is you may be worrying that I'm straying very far from this big structure of the uh, homology which we're trying to build into little exercises about surfaces. But I beg your forbearance to actually look at these exercises. They're fun and we'll get back to the homology in a moment. So what happens here? I started with an A and I took the co-product of A, which would be some sum over things in this guy module and things in this module. I don't know what sum, so I've written sum on A, A1 tensor A2. And then I'm going to apply epsilon here, which brings this back into the ring. So I get epsilon of A1 tensor A2, but it just becomes the sum of that this is just a ring element, and I multiply. And after I've multiplied, that's what has to be equal to A. So I need that this formula should be true. So let's look at what happens in our case. Suppose we take A equal to one. Then we have the multiplication of delta one. And delta one is one tensor X plus X tensor one, 
but we apply epsilon to the one tensor x and the x tensor one, and we get, after multiplying, epsilon of one times x plus epsilon of x times one should be equal to one. How can that be? Well, you see, you need epsilon of one, zero, and you need epsilon of x equal to one. And so, in fact, that is our, our result that we need this. We're going to define a co-unit with epsilon of one equal to zero and epsilon of x equal to one. And we've extended our algebra to include this co-unit. Then you can, you can see how various cobordisms evaluate. For example, um, if you started with a little sphere, then you would start with a one in the ring and it goes by the unit into one. Then uh, that means you have a one on this circle and then you apply epsilon to one, but epsilon of one is zero. So the value of this cobordism, starting from the vacuum and ending in the vacuum is zero. On the other hand, if you took a torus, you start with a one in the ring you apply the co -unit, the unit, and you get one on this circle. Now you do the uh, co-product, co and you get one tensor x plus x tensor one, and then you multiply and you get two x. And then you get epsilon of two x, which is just two epsilon of x, two. So a torus gets value two. And I leave it to you to check that higher genus surfaces get value zero. They do. Now, I do want to talk about how we're going to do this over the integers. So let me explain that by drawing by hand because I think I didn't put it in the slideshow. So I want to look at the structure of our categories. Let's consider. Um, in the case of, um, of two, of three, let's consider three. So we start out with three A's and any one of the A's can become a B. And then here, we're going to have um, three states also. We're going to have one where we have two Bs and an A. We're going to have one where we have a, a B and an A and a B. And we're going to have one where we have an A and a B and a B. And then over here, we're going to have a state with three Bs. So. This is the general structure and the general structure of signs that we wish will be on the general structure of the category like this. So let's see, what are the next uh, morphisms? There's a morphism here changing the middle A to a B and there's a morphism changing the end A to a B. There's a morphism here changing the first A to a B giving B, B, A. There's a morphism here changing the end A to a B down there. There's a morphism here, changing the first A to a B, giving B a B, and a morphism here, changing the second A to a B, which is giving A B B. So that's the structure there. And these all go in like this. And this is called the cube category. Because after all, um, maybe we can emphasize it, you see quite clearly that what we're looking at is the structure of a cube. Um, and, um, and in general, these are the structure of the vertices of a cube and a category that's associated with a cube. 
Um, and what we want to explain is what the sign should be on each one of these maps. And the sign is going to be as follows. Suppose you have uh, one of these kinds of things. You have some stuff, and then you have an A, and then you have some stuff, and you're going to change this over by the boundary, by the local boundary mapping to a B. And I want to know what sign to put on this, and the answer is going to be minus one to the number of A's preceding the given A. So I want to know how many A's are there in here, right there. If it's zero, I want the parity of that. So for example, let's put the signs on the, on the edges now. Um, I changed the first A, there no, nobody's proceeding, it's plus. I changed the second A and there's one proceeding, it's minus. I changed the third A and there's two proceeding, it's plus. Here, I changed uh, this A to a B and there are no A's proceeding, so it's plus. And the next case, I changed this A and there's one A proceeding and it's minus. In this case, I changed, uh, uh, I changed this A, and that's a plus. And then I changed this A, it has an A preceding, so it's a minus. In this case, I changed this A, and that's a plus. And I changed this A, and that's a minus. In this case, I changed the last A, and it's a plus. I changed this A, and it's a minus. And I changed this A, and it's a plus. And there are all the signs. Now, you take a square, um, you go plus, plus, minus, plus. You see, the parity is shifted by one around any square that you choose to examine. Try this square. Um, and you see you have plus, minus, but you have minus, minus. So you can verify that that works. And that will, this will then imply that boundary composed with boundary is equal to zero over the integers. So that's how we do this. And um, this may be reminiscent of the boundary of a simplex where you change signs alternately going across the boundary of a simplex. Very reminiscent of that. So that's the rule for the signs. So now, believe it or not, we have defined the chain complex for the Carvana homology. And next time, at the beginning, I will, um, I'll actually do some calculations. We're going to stay more or less theoretical in this talk, but I'll do some calculations the next time. Uh, let me see, get that a little smaller. There. Um, here's our cube category again. Um, and I like to, I wanted to remark something. This is a very elementary exercise, but it's kind of fun. Um, I want to remark that I like to think of this cube as A arrow B cubed, just like you think of a classical cube as A plus B cubed. Let me show you what I mean by that. We are digressing, but this is kind of fun. You might enjoy it. So let's go back to elementary algebra. A plus B squared. A plus B squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. And we often 
think, ah, yes, that's a, the same as this structure from geometry. Where I have a squared and AB and BA and B squared. Um, but now I, I want to categorify this. And a categorifying means, in this case, replacing the plus by an arrow and trying to retain as many rules as I can. So I'm going to, rep I'm going to think about what would A arrow B squared be? I'm squaring a little category with one arrow in it. So I give it a try. I say, well, this is A arrow B times A arrow B. And I want to retain distributive law. Generally, I'm trying to retain distributive laws. So this would be A arrow B times A, whatever that might mean. And that would be an arrow to A arrow B times B. As if it were plus, that's what you would have written. But of course, now that means I have to have some notion of a product of these. And then I'm going to continue distributing and I would have AA arrow BA and an arrow to AB arrow BB and with the desire to retain distributive laws I have entered into higher categories where a higher category means that there exist morphisms between morphisms. That is what I have written here might be better expressed this way, AA goes to BA, there must be these objects. They're the objects of the cube category, as you see. And BA goes to BB. But in this structure, the next arrow is an arrow between the arrows. And so I want one more thing to get to the cube category, and that will be flatten, what I call flatten. And flatten, flatten takes object to object prime and a morphism from there to another object um, p to p prime it takes it to a morphism in the lower category just below that one where there are morphisms between the ends as in we're going to be a morphism from o to p and a morphism from o prime to p prime and this will be commuting. So now I'm adding to the definitions that I'm creating, the definition of flattening a higher category at one step into a lower category. And if I flatten this, then I get the cube category, as you see. That's a very complicated way, um, a categorical way, to get to the same uh, structure that we just got um, by drawing a picture in geometry, right? But it is, as you see, exactly the logical, the mathematical logical structure of what this is and what this correspondence is. What you're saying when you say a plus b squared corresponds to that picture of a cube decomposed is that you categorified the a plus b into an a arrow b, you expanded it into a higher category and flattened it and got the cube category. Um, it's amusing to think along these lines and see how it goes when you take another power. Let's just do it for fun.
So now we want A or O B cubed, which is going to be A arrow B applied to And you see that's going to be equal to AAA AAB ABA ABB BAA BAB BBA BBB And when you flatten that, you'll get the cube category. So, um, so this is elementary categorifications and elementary higher categories, but I think it's worth thinking about this because if you think about how the category arises for the polynomial that we're looking at, for the invariance that we're looking at, you may think about it in terms of other categorical ways of thinking about knots and links. For example, you may, let me do it with a tangle and, and leave it at that, but here is a bit of a tangle representing the Trefoil knot in Morse form. And you can think of replacing of this by the arrow, A if you like, arrow B, you see. And then this becomes A arrow becomes The cube of that flattened, of course. And so the Kovanov category of the link, when it's in Morse form, and you do have a product structure, um, is is uh, is arising out of the algebra of categorifying the individual basic morphism of uh, corresponding to the crossing. So one might hope that. One so the one may hope um, to um, extend this idea to other categorifications. of link invariance. I don't I don't know how to do it if that's simply. It's similar to what happens when you categorify other link invariants. But the fact of the matter is that the bracket notion that the crossing corresponds to a categorification of A plus B into um into A arrow B is at the basis of what we're doing here. That of uh, that structure, that extension of a, of an ad addition into an ordered arrow, which makes for the category and the rest of the structure, is implicit in what we're doing. And one could wonder whether there's a similar small but, but potent structural categorification that's at the base of other link invariants, if you could find it and articulate it in the right way. You could say, yes, the question is already being answered um, by the people who do categorifications of of other invariants, but uh, maybe maybe with a lot of extra work going on. We don't know 
how simple it could be. So that was, this is the slide that corresponds to what I was just talking about. Okay. Now, much of this is repeating what I said. Then there's a bit of formalism that I want to skip and I'll come back to it. But I do want to remind you about chain homotopy. I think I'd better use my board again. But let me remind you about it after I've done my work. Here's my work. I want to think about how what we have defined without doing much calculation with it is related to the Reitermeister moves. It's very important. We want to see that what we have defined is actually, if you get the gradings right, invariant under the second Reitermeister move and then under the third, but we'll worry about the second today. So I have indicated here the local structure of the category for this bit of diagram, which has a second Reitermeister move available. And then I've indicated here where the local structure of the category without the Reitermeister move. So all I see is two parallel lines here. And of course, there's all the rest of the category, but we're just focusing in on this, which is there in every single state. And here we have an A smoothing here and an A smoothing there, and that's the AA. And then we have A to B and B to A and B to B. And I have labeled these boundary two, boundary one, boundary two, boundary one. So, you know, boundary two is, is operating on this one and boundary one is operating on this one. And here's our commuting square. But this is a more complicated structure than this. And in order to get a relationship between the chain complex, which has all this in it, and the chain complex, which has only this in it, we need, a map, we need chain mappings, which go back and forth. And I'm going to describe these chain mappings just in terms of making little cobordisms, because we know that we can describe our mappings by using cobordisms. After we've done that, I can make a remark to the effect that everything I did was actually just described in terms of cobordisms, and why did I need the algebra at all? I just need cobordisms with certain properties. But we have the algebra, and we can think that way, and we understand that we can make mappings by using cobordisms. So how do we compare? We have this guy down here, and we, we have to map him to this stuff up here. Well, we can map the parallel lines to the upper one by the identity because it, it, it's the same structure. We can map the parallel lines to the, end, to the other one by going through a saddle point and giving birth to a circle. That's a cobordism. Go through a saddle point and give birth to a circle. It takes you from here to there. And then we take the direct sum of those two maps to go into the middle chain complex. Okay, every other map is defined by cobordism as well. For example, um, um, boundary two allows this circle to die, um, and um, and it does it by connecting it up to B by a little saddle point. I'll have some pictures of these in a moment. But now I'm interested in comparing these two chain complexes, and that's where chain homotopy comes in how you can compare two chain complexes by thinking about chain homotopies between them. And so let me go back to the definition of a chain homotopy between two maps between chain complexes. So what we have is we have F and G, which are going from one chain complex to another. And we say that F and G are chain homotopic if 
there exists another mapping H from C to C prime, which shifts everybody up in dimension by one, such that the boundary of H plus H boundary is equal to the difference between F and G. And it's at this point that I think I'd better go off to my slide and talk about this a little bit, in case you hadn't thought about it recently. So I have a chain complex C and another one C prime. And I have mappings F and G taking C to C prime. And I say that F is chain homotopic to G if there exists H taking now. Let's use chain complexes of the kind that we're using here. Cn goes by boundary to Cn plus 1. Uh, that's the kind of indexing we're using. It's usually the other way, but it's just indexing. And C prime n will go by boundary to C prime n plus 1. So that's the, 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 that's the kind of indexing we're using in the Kovano complex. So then we need an H which goes the other way. The H is going to go from a CN to a C prime N minus one. It's going to go backwards. And we want the formula that the boundary of H plus H boundaries should be equal to F minus G. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to convince you that this implies, if you have this, that F and G induce the same map on, on homology. Or maybe I'll just state it. The, the point that I want to make actually though is that what this is, is it's an algebraic image of a homotopy. So it will help to think about what that means. You will have some space X which is mapping to some other space Y. And it's mapping by two mappings. So maybe the image of X and Y under one mapping is here. And the image of X and Y under the other mapping is over here. And when we say these two mappings are homotopic, if there is a mapping from X cross I, into Y, called H, or it's script H, such that when it's restricted to the top, it's this one, and when it's restricted to the bottom, it's this one, and it fills it in. So that means that H will look like this.
h of x cross i. So, so you see that what you want when you're looking at a homotopy is you want to be able to associate um, to, um, to a, a given block, you want to associate something such that the boundary of that is the difference between f and g, and then h on the boundary, which is the boundary here. So you see that what we have is that um, we have that the boundary of h of x, um, the boundary of a of of a of uh, a h of x. If you think of h of x as this thing here, um, um, plus a uh, uh, plus h of the boundary of x again is just equal to f minus g of x. That's the picture you have here. You have h of x, that's this part. You have h of the boundary of x, which is this part here. And then you have the remaining part, f minus g here. So this is the algebraic picture of, um, of a homotopy. And, um, and it's not hard to see that, um, that it then has all the properties of a homotopy. If two things are homotopic, they induce the same maps on homology. And we say that we say C and C prime are chain homotopy equivalent if there exists F taking C to C prime, G taking C prime to C, such that um, G composed with F is chain homotopic to the identity on C, and F composed with G is chain homotopic to the identity on C prime. And uh, under those circumstances, then the, the homology of C will be isomorphic to the homology of C prime. So if we want to understand that two things have the same homology groups, we can understand it by showing that their chain complexes are chain homotopy equivalent. That's the background. And now let's go back to our pictures for this situation. We would like to get a chain homotopy to happen. Now, as I said, the chain homotopy mapping goes backwards, right? That's the only thing you have to remember, that it goes in the opposite direction from the boundary. Uh, up here on the top, everything is just fine, because if I take this up by the identity and I take this down by the identity, then the compositions in this part are the same, but are down here, uh, are identical, but if uh, but down here it's another matter. Let's see what happens. I start here, I go up, and then I come back down. And maybe this is a non-trivial map. I have to look at it. I start here, and I go all the way up, and I come back down, and that's the identity. So I have to look at the composition of f and g. Now we'll look at it in the next slide. Uh, I also have to look at the composition in the other direction. In the other direction, I am starting here, and I go down, and then I go back up. And I have to look at that one, and I want to see that that one is chain homotopic to the identity. And I suggest on my homotopies here. Now, what could my homotopies be? There isn't much choice at the level of choosing cobordism. What kind of a map can you make from this to that? Well, you can give birth to a circle. 
And what can you do here? You can let a circle die. So we'll try those. So here's our situation. F and G. Now let me let me crib a little bit there. F goes from two parallel lines to circle between like that. That's the F. And the G, the G goes from circle between down to two parallel lines. And as I said, we take the simplest example, simplest method. We uh, we go through a saddle and give birth, or, or we go through a saddle and um, and give birth in the other direction, or we give, or I'm sorry, or we we allow it to die and go through a saddle. Now we have to think of F composed with G. That's the one that goes this way and on the lower part. And look at that. Would you look at that? When you did F and then you did G, you got a little sphere in the middle. And we know that the sphere values to zero in the cobordism. So that part went away. And that meant that in this direction, there was nothing to do. It was going to be the identity. Um, and there's no worry about the chain homotopy over here. Then we have to consider the other composition. And the other composition is, um, is um, drawn on the next slide. And I also need uh, to think of, um, of the boundary compositions, but I won't worry you about them. So let's go again. Here we are, F and G um, and the boundaries. And we need to think about which one. We need to think about going from here, doing G, and then doing F. Doing G and then doing F, that's interesting. You can see it. I know it's on the next slide. But if you put G on top of F, you got a little tube in the middle, and you got a little cap here and a little cup there. Then we have boundary 1 and boundary 2. And boundary 1 and boundary 2 were uh, were mappings which took a circle and uh, made it, uh, which brought forth a circle in the case of boundary one and did away with the circle in the case of boundary two. You've got to go back and look. You can go back and look when you look at the slideshow later, but boundary two, um, you see, um, boundary two over here on the bottom. Boundary two on the bottom does away with a circle by going through a saddle, and boundary one gives birth to a circle. And there they are, boundary one and boundary two. Um, whoop, there we are. Boundary one giving birth to a circle, and boundary two amalgamating. And we have the homotopies H1 and H2, which are letting a circle die and giving birth to one. And we're looking at this structure here. So we put them together. We have the composition. And we have to compare that. I'm working mod 2, so I didn't write a difference. Um, we have the composition, and we have the identity mapping. And we're comparing that with h1 and boundary 1, and boundary 2 and h2. And this sum has to be equal to that sum. And nobody said that this was true in our cobordisms. Nobody said it out loud, right? This is some identity about the cobordisms. But there's a pattern here, and this is a pattern that Dora Barnaton noticed. And this is this whole exposition is following his paper on tangle cobordisms, which I'll put into the Dropbox. So what you see here is. If you were to remove this tube, you would see four bits of surface. Left surface, right surface, top surface, bottom surface, and a tube between them. Here you see a tube between the top surface and the bottom surface. Here you see a tube between the left surface and the bottom surface. And here you see a tube between the top surface and the right surface. And we're seeing that the Chain homotopy, the desired chain homotopy, is this relationship of cobordisms. Please just work mod two for now and we'll worry about signs next time. That's what we need. 
But I'm going to tell you what the signs are for this, and then you can compare. You see, this is the picture. We have, I threw away everything except the pattern of tubing. We have four bits of surface. We have tubing between them. I've labeled them one, two, three, and four. And then we go tubing one and two, tubing two and three, tubing three and four, and tubing four and one. Those are the tubings that we have. One, two, three, four, one and two, three and four, one and four, and two and three. Or one and two minus two and three plus three and four minus one and four. One, two, two, three, three, four, one, four. That turns out to be the right organization for the signs. This should be trivial. Well, what we're about to see, and that will be maybe near the end of what we're going to do today, is that this is true in our Frobenius algebra. And so that implies that we do get invariance under the second Reitermeister move. Our Frobenius algebra is weaker than all cobordisms, and this relation among cobordisms is actually a consequence of our Frobenius algebra. So that the four-tube relation is true, and therefore the theory is invariant under second Reitermeister move. And you can do more work to get it invariant under third as well, similarly. Well, that's the story, the four-tube relation. So what we're going to study now for a little while is the four-tube relation and see that it actually lives in our Frobenius algebra. So here it is schematically, four surfaces. And I've tubed one and two, three and four, one and four, and two and three. Well, I'm going to show you what it does to a single tube. So... To do that, I start with a, a surface up here that's connected, and I think of two patches in it that are near one another, labeled one and two, and two patches down here that are labeled four and three. And now the four tube relation says one to four plus two to three is equal to one to two plus three to four, putting in tubes. So that says twice one to four, twice a tube here, and now I've drawn it, a tube, surface up here, surface down there. And I divided by two. And then I have a little torus here, and I have a little torus down there. So it says that a single tube can be written as the sum of two broken tubes with a little torus and another little torus and a one half. But now you have to remember that the torus evaluated to two and that it produced an X just before it closed off. I think we want to review this so you see what I'm saying. You start with a one because you started from the vacuum and you produce a one out of the out of the ground ring by the unit. And then you got to here and you had one tensor X plus X tensor one. And then you got down to here multiplying and you got two X. So you got two X, but we're dividing by two. We take one half of a torus. And so one half of a torus is the same as this with an X in it. As long as you have a torus, it means you have an X on that, on that line right there. So that means that, that means that symbolically, I can, if I wish, say, ah, this guy here is really a little uh, a little cap with a dot on it. And the dot means there's an X because that's the way it behaves. It behaves as though there was an X there. 
And uh, this one down here similarly behaves as though there were an X there. And so we get another way of thinking about what the tube relation says. The four tube relation implies that a single tube breaks up into a sum of two tubes, one of which has an X labeling it and the other has an X labeling it. And this can be regarded as an identity in the algebra. As an identity in the algebra. What could it mean? Let's see if I kept the slide. So I got myself to this curious uh, bend. I'm looking at a relation in cobordism with labels from the algebra, and I have that this should be the same as this and this plus this and this, where dot equals x, our x from the algebra. So this, this actually is saying something about the way things would behave because I could, let me draw it again so we can play with it more easily. What if I put an alpha in here and then it comes out alpha? Now, if I put an alpha in here, then I get x alpha. And this is units, so this is 1. So what comes out here, here I'm getting just alpha comes out. What I get out here is I'm getting epsilon of x alpha. Epsilon of alpha x, let's say, since you think of that as x. That's what this computes, and here, epsilon of alpha x times 1, putting us in the algebra, we multiply by 1, plus epsilon of alpha times x. So it says there must be an identity in the algebra which says this. Is this true? Let's check. It says that 1 is equal to epsilon of x times 1 plus epsilon of 1 times x. Now, let's see. You, and that would be the same as saying epsilon of x is 1, 1 times 1, plus epsilon of 1, which was 0, times x. And that's correct. Okay, good. Now, what about... Um, x it says that x is equal to epsilon of x squared times 1 plus epsilon of x times x. But x squared is 0, so this is equal to 0 plus epsilon of x was equal to 1 times x. x equals 0 plus 1 times x, also true. So this is correct in our algebra. So that says that the tube relation is true. Now you see, I've been wandering around, but uh, but the, the wandering is uh, is very significant because what we have shown then is that uh, this tube relation implies invariance under the second Dreidemeister move. But we have to see that tube relation actually implies forward tube relation, and it does. That's the other bit of the logic. If you had a tube relation, then you have the four tube relation the x disappears. We get this relation among the cobordisms. 
And the reason is one of those alternating uh, uh, substitution arguments. You see, look at it and you see how easy it is once you've got it. <clears throat> Here's the four tube relation I wish to prove is equal to zero. I expand each tube by this relation. I get two diagrams from it. Dot on the left, dot on the right. Dot on the top, dot on the bottom. Dot on the left, dot on the right. And dot on the top, dot on the bottom. And then I look at all of these and see that they cancel each other out. Like this one with the upper dot on the left is canceled by... Uh, mm, mm, this one with an upper dot on the left. And they all cancel. So that means that this relation is the same as four tube relation, and we're complete as far as checking the second randomized remove. And it all came from cobordisms, just cobordisms. And so there are two morals to this story. One of them is Drawer is a very beautiful moral that the whole theory didn't need the algebra. You could have just said that you would think of the structure of the category with its cobordism morphisms, but allow the category to kind of collapse into an abstract chain complex so you could add maps. He called it the canopoly. We could just call it the chain, the, uh, the categorical chain complex. And it, it isn't really quite algebraic. It has all these maps, but it has a chain homotopy type defined the same way I did with mappings. So it has a chain homotopy type, and the chain homotopy type of the abstract categorical complex is the invariant. Well, I think you need the algebra to kind of get grounded, but, but that's what the uh, essence of the invariant really is. The invariant is a way of measuring the category, and this is an abstract way of measuring the category by thinking of it that way. Well, we're measuring it with algebra, so we could actually calculate homology groups. And you can do more. You can figure out the structure of the co-product by using the tube relation. I won't bother you with that. And you can, um, you can find out what sort of algebra would have a tube relation, as though you didn't know the algebra. This is a very interesting exercise and a good one for us to look at for a moment. Here we're going to assume we have the tube relation. We have an X in the algebra, but that's all we know. The algebra has an X, but we don't know anything about the X. We don't know that X squared is equal to zero anymore. It has a co-unit and it has a unit, and we don't know what the co-unit and the unit are anymore either. But we have the tubing relation. Alpha is epsilon of alpha X times one plus alpha of epsilon of alpha times zero. So we try it out. And we get x equals epsilon of x squared plus epsilon of x times x. And we get 1 is equal to epsilon of x times 1 plus epsilon of 1 times x. Now, you look at this and you say, well, I have to get x. If I'm going to get x, that means that epsilon of x squared is 0. And epsilon of x is 1. And epsilon of 1 had better be equal to 0. So I need these. I need these, but that doesn't tell me that x squared is zero. It just tells me that epsilon of x squared is zero. And then I could try x squared, and x squared would be equal to epsilon of x cubed times one plus epsilon of x squared times x. Epsilon of x squared is zero, so I get epsilon of x cubed times one over here. So that says x squared, x squared is a constant times one. x squared is some constant. It'll still work. Aha. Uh -huh. And then you can work out, by using the tubing relation, you can work out what the coproduct is going to be. And you'll find out that the coproduct will be of the form for x, some multiple of 1 times 1 plus x tensor x, and for 1, x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x. So the upshot of this is that if you start with the four tube relation, you're guaranteed to get a, a link homology if you use this algebra here. This algebra really does work. It's more general than the one we started with. X squared is some constant. Epsilon of X is one, epsilon of one is zero. Delta is this, 
and delta of x has an extra term in it. And when k, the k, the extra term here, k, is 0, you get the Kovanov one, the one we started with. And when k is equal to 1, you get another one called Li, due to Li, Yuson Li. Um, and Li's, Li's algebra also gives us a homology. And for that matter, you could unify and use them all together at once. But in fact, what has been done is to use Li homology separately and compare it with Kovanov homology. Li homology does not satisfy that the J that we had remains constant. The J will change when you take the boundary. There, that means that there's a filtration that happens that's different from what happens in Kovanov homology. And it turns out that by comparing Li and Kovanov together, Ross Moosen was able to produce a very beautiful invariant which allowed him to prove some remarkable properties about knots and link cobordism. And I told you last time that uh, Heather Dye and, uh, and Aaron Kessner and myself generalized the Lee homology and the, and the Rasmussen invariant to virtual Kovanov homology. And that's the next stage in this long story, is to show you how you can generalize this Kovanov homology to virtual knots. So I don't want to talk about Lee's algebra right now. I just think I want to talk for just a minute about what the problem is in working with virtual knots, and then we'll stop for today. So how how will this how will this kind of theory of getting an invariant be different for virtual knots? Well, there's one key difference. And it looks like this. Here's a smoothing of type A, and here's a virtual crossing. And we're supposed to have an arrow in our state complex to here. But this has one cycle, and this has one cycle. No change. So this is, call this mapping eta. It's not a multiplication or a co-multiplication. The multiplication took two circles to one. The co-multiplication took one circle to two. But this takes one circle to one circle. And so the question is, what to do? And there's more than one answer. One answer is a to equals zero and make some new rules. Another answer is change something else. To change something else is particularly interesting, and we may talk about it. William Rushworth's work uh, involves changing something else. You can look at his paper, Doubled, E-O-U, Doubled Kovanov Homology. We're going to follow, we're going to follow this route. And we have to see then what's going to happen to various compositions. Um, uh, and we'll find out that some of them are only working modulo two and we have to do something very tricky uh, in order to make it work over the integers where we want to be. But it's 1030 now, so I won't start doing that. But next time, we, I'm willing to answer any questions about what we did already. We should do a computation of some small complex, and we will begin talking about how to do it with virtual knots next time. So I'll stop here.
question. Uh, what is the relationship between Lee homology and the Jones polynomial? Um, if there's no direct relationship between Lee homology and the Jones polynomial, it doesn't categorify, uh, Lee homology is not categorifying the Jones polynomial. In order to get the Jones polynomial, we pretty much needed to have that J filtration not being changed. So what you're seeing here is that there actually is more structure in the states than the Jones polynomial. The Jones polynomial is coming out as the characteristic polynomial, the graded or the characteristic polynomial of the original Kobana homology. Now, I still like your question though, um, because when we look at the Rasmussen invariant, which we will, we'll see that the crosstalk between the Lee homology and the Kovanov homology is giving us a lot of information. And maybe, maybe some of that could be summarized inside the Jones polynomial. I don't know. So keep that question in mind. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you next week.